There could be countless microscopic alien machines sitting on the moon right now. They arrived millions of years ago and went dormant, waiting beneath the lunar dust for a specific trigger like an expanding human presence before activating and executing their primary protocol. The rationale behind this idea is that if intelligent life exists elsewhere in the galaxy, one of the most logical technologies they could develop is self-replicating robotics. These machines would use the most abundant raw materials in space to build copies of themselves and spread across the galaxy. The capabilities of such probes would depend entirely on their programming. They could map star systems or terraform planets or even build massive orbital habitats and infrastructure, all without further input from their creators. Due to exponential propagation, a civilization slightly more advanced than us could seed the entire Milky Way with these probes in less than a million years. Such civilization would need to create only one unit, and from there, the probe would eventually spread its copies everywhere, even if the civilization that created it goes extinct. For the purposes of the Fermi Paradox, we're particularly interested in one chilling subclass of von Neumann probes, the Death Swarms. Unlike exploratory or resource-gathering probes, Death Swarms would be designed not to build, but to erase. According to this hypothesis, they would be seeded throughout the galaxy, lying dormant in countless star systems. They would wait in silence for millions of years, embedded in moons or orbiting debris fields. Their purpose? To awaken only when a civilization within the system crosses a certain technological threshold. The reason for their existence remains speculative. Perhaps they would be programmed with explicitly hostile intent, a kind of preemptive defense mechanism against future rivals. Or perhaps their purpose is more detached or ecological. They might be designed to reset worlds that display signs of artificial interference, preserving a kind of galactic natural order. To them, a growing technological civilization might be seen as contamination, something to be pruned before it spreads. The trigger for such an awakening could be any activity resembling early rise of a spacefaring species like helium-3 mining or some other off-world activity. Once activated, the swarms would silently descend toward Earth, disguised as harmless cosmic dust. Upon landing, they would begin a cold, methodical process of disintegration, atomizing artificial structures and infrastructure. The goal would be to wipe the slate clean and return the planet to a more natural state. At first, the effect might be localized, a single village reduced to sterile ash, slowly crumbling into dust, as if aging in fast forward. The spread would be slow and eerily quiet, expanding outward like the creeping shimmer in the film annihilation. We would almost certainly fight back. Conventional weapons, even nuclear warheads, might destroy clusters of the swarm. But this would make the situation worse in the long run, as some probes would undoubtedly survive the blast and land miles away, seeding new epicenters. Containment would become impossible unless we sterilized the entire planet in one coordinated nuclear purge. And even then, survival is not guaranteed. These probes could be programmed to consume only artificial objects and leave everything natural intact. They could even be programmed to consume only the technologically capable biomass, like humans. This scenario isn't just science fiction horror. It ties directly into one of the most haunting concepts in astrobiology, the Great Filters. The idea is simple. Somewhere between the emergence of life and the rise of a galaxy-spanning civilization, there must be a bottleneck, a step so hard to pass that nearly every civilization fails. Self-replicating swarms of microscopic machines, sometimes called the Grey Goo, could very well be that filter. They represent a class of technology so powerful and so uncontrollable that any species that invents it without extreme caution may not survive the consequences. Once released, even unintentionally, such a swarm could spiral out of control like a virus, but one with no cure. And unlike a virus, it wouldn't merely infect, it would consume and repurpose everything into more copies of itself. If death swarms are a common invention among civilizations, then the galaxy may be littered with dead worlds, once bright sparks of intelligence 
extinguished by their own creations. This wouldn't be a problem for us, except for one unsettling fact. Those creations wouldn't die with them. Instead, they would likely go on consuming everything in their path. In theory, the only way to fight such a swarm would be to develop a counter-swarm, nanobots designed to neutralize or destroy the first wave. But this solution brings its own horrors. Two opposing swarms wouldn't simply cancel each other out, they would compete. Each would try to outproduce the other, consuming everything in their environment to gain the upper hand. In the process, they could transform entire Earth into a battleground of molecular warfare, until nothing is left but raw dust and malfunctioning fragments. If these machines are real, if death swarms are lurking in our cosmic neighborhood, then the obvious question arises, why haven't we seen them yet? One possibility is that these probes are too small to escape Earth and would probably get stranded, so they are likely programmed to avoid worlds with dense atmospheres altogether. Airless bodies like asteroids or dwarf planets like Pluto offer a far more attractive alternative. These environments are easy to land on and easier still to leave. They provide raw materials for replication and most crucially they are quiet. No erosion or plate tectonics and no storms to bury or destroy delicate instruments. And this could explain our lack of encounters. Earth is hostile, not just because of its gravity and atmosphere, but because it's alive, not only geologically, but even biologically. Any alien artifact that landed here millions of years ago would likely have been destroyed or buried beyond recognition. But the moon, that's a different story. The moon is a cosmic time capsule. With no atmosphere and negligible tectonic activity, anything that lands there tends to stay there perfectly preserved. Its surface is exposed, but paradoxically protective. Exposed to the vacuum of space, yet protected from decay. Probes that arrived millions, or even billions of years ago, could still be sitting intact beneath the regolith, dormant and waiting. And there wouldn't just be one type of probe, but a diverse ecosystem of autonomous machines built by different civilizations at different times, and they might actually compete with one another in a Darwinistic fashion, or even have conflicting missions. Given enough variety of species, they might even form a type of artificial ecology, or should they also have a form of artificial intelligence, a society? In that context, we might be surrounded by relics of long-dead alien civilizations, remnants of failed experiments or abandoned projects that are still executing long-forgotten directives. To us, the lunar surface might look still and silent, but underneath that silence, there could be a vast, invisible activity. Although Sophons from the three-body problem were conceptually inspired by earlier science fiction ideas like death swarms or berserker probes, the two technologies diverge more than they align. Sophons are scalpel-like tools of control, designed to keep humanity tightly leashed, ensuring the entire invasion unfolds in utter silence. They don't destroy, they paralyze. Berserker probes, on the other hand, are blunt instruments of annihilation. Where Sophons infiltrate and suppress, these probes annihilate. Some might wonder why not simply send these inexpensive probes instead of going through all the trouble with multidimensional Sophons. The answer is simple. Aware of the great filters that may have doomed countless civilizations before them, the Trisolarans would undoubtedly fear such reckless technology. In their eyes, unleashing unstoppable death machines isn't a weapon. It's a risk too great to take.